we have seen the forces of the elements. We have seen how man suffers through fire, water, earth, air. So what remains? Where is going to be salvation? In the world which is broken into fragments, how can salvation reach? Who would be the guiding force? So many questions and one single voice trying to give us some idea as to how to overcome, how to at least hope for a renewal when everything fails. This is what Iliad will be trying to do in the fifth part and the final part of this massive poem which we are going to look at today. So let us find out what the thunder said. Although the final part of the wasteland can be read without any references, yes, without any references, but it would be useful if we keep in mind two major allusions uh, that served as the backdrop of Eliot's development of idea. One involves the story about Jesus' resurrection and the other is the story of Chapel Perilous, which appears in the Grail Legends. I will speak at length on those when we come to those points of references in the poem so that you can link how the lines in the poem relate to these themes. After the torchlight red on sweaty faces, after the frosty silence in the gardens, after the agony in stony places, the shouting and the crying, prison and palace and reverberation of thunder of spring over distant mountains. He who was living is now dead. We who were living are now dying with a little patience. There is a renewal of the same idea of wasting away, dying away, which we had seen in previous sections as well. In the section Death by Water, we see that there is a kind of link to the past blending into the present and here he is giving us some idea about what the present looks like. Note the words sweaty faces, frosty silence, agony in stony places. All these different pictures, they give off the emotion of disillusionment, the emotion of decay. This is imagism. He is giving you images and he is not giving you the words with reference to emotions. He is giving you words with reference to certain pictorial situations. And out of those situations, those images, you are forming your own emotional connections. So this is also the objective correlative which Eliot really emphasized. There is a noticeable use of repeating the word after in the first three lines, after the torchlight red, after the frosty silence, after the agony in stony places, as if he's building up an anticipation. After this what? And when you say after something bad, you expect that you will talk about something good. Now, is he doing that? He's saying, he who was living is now dead. Who is he referring to? Is he referring to Christ? That he was living uh, just a few days back and now he's dead. So is he talking about a transitional moment after Christ's birth and before his renewal? So he is talking about an intermittent time, a space suspended between the death of Christ and his resurrection. What was happening to the people around him? They were expectant, they were hopeful or were they in despair? Did the people know? that Christ was going to be resurrected. He goes on describing the scene. Here is no water but only rock. Rock and no water and the sandy road, the road winding above among the mountains, which are mountains of rock without water. If there were water, we should stop and drink. Amongst the rock one cannot stop or think. Sweat is dry and feet are in the sand. How can sweat be dry? When sweat makes you feel dry, then sweat becomes dry. It becomes an agent of dryness, 
although sweat itself is formed of water. The whole scene is a vivid description of a journey through a land where there is no relief in front of you. And what happens when a person journeys through the desert? He begins to hallucinate, to have the mirage in front of him, as if he can see some reflection of water somewhere distant from him. And that is happening to this person who is encountering this journey through desert. If there were only water amongst the rock, dead mountain, mouth of carious teeth that cannot spit. So the mountains are dead because they are not providing the relieving water, relieving waterfalls. And they are like bearing their teeth like monsters. Here one can neither stand nor lie nor sit. So when you turn this uh, into an idea of a metaphor, connecting to the wasteland that Eliot was seeing around him, the wasteland of modernity, standing up for your convictions, sitting down to contemplate and lying down in rest, neither of these are possible. The curse of the modern existence is the curse of not being able to be in a comfortable position spiritually. There is not even silence in the mountains. It's not even a place where you can sit back and think about reality because there is a constant disturbance, a disturbance which is not talking about relief but talking about anxiety. What kind of sounds are heard here? But dry, sterile thunder without rain. There is not even solitude in the mountains, but red, sullen faces sneer and snarl from doors of mud-cracked houses. A very eerie situation here. The idea of the zombied reality or zombied humanity, that idea uh, is echoed in this expression that people are staring at you from mud-cracked cottages, dried up, dehydrated. So there is no solitude, there is no silence, there is no circumstance for contemplation. There is only dryness if there were water. This happens, as I was telling you, when you are traveling across a desert, you would wish there was water. If there were water and no rock, if there were rock, okay, this person who is journeying across the desert, first he wants water and no rocks and then he says, I can manage with rocks only if there was water. If there were rock and also water, and water, a spring, a pool among the rock, the idea of an idyllic space, a paradise, an oasis. If there were the sound of water only, not the cicada, and then this traveler feels that even if he had to journey across this desert without water, he could manage it. But he can't do that because of the disturbing noises which keep reminding him of dryness. So he says, if there were the sound of water only, if I could at least have the feeling that there is water close by and not this dry sound of insects all around me and the dry grass singing, but sound of water over a rock where the hermit thrush sings in the pine trees, drip, drop. Drip, drop, 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 drop. But there is no water. So he creates this image of a paradise and then he gives the idea of the fallen state, the wasted state. There is no water. So this is kind of a direct hit at the romantic idea or the idea of the romantics that you can create salvation through imagination. This person tries to do that. He tries to imagine water and then birds and then suddenly reality hits back that there is no water. So there is no point in imagining this. Suddenly the scene shifts and we aren't even sure who the narrator is anymore. Is this Tiresias? Is he commenting on the situation of the present times? And he says, who is the third who walks always beside you? Now, during Iliad's time, there was an expedition done to Antarctica. You know, it's freezing cold and these explorers, uh, they later on gave an account uh, that they couldn't see much in the hazy snow 
all around but they could always feel that there was always an extra person in their group when they were counting they always felt that there is somebody else so this uncanny presence of someone else you can see it as death walking with you you can see the god walking with you or the devil walking with you but that identity is never confirmed because it is always in the shades so this idea of the third person walking beside you uh, this is very much evocative of a feeling of anxiety as if you are being watched when i count there are only you and i together but when i look ahead up the white road there is always another one walking beside you gliding wrapped in a brown mantle hooded this whole image of a hooded figure this coincides with the idea of death which follows man everywhere but interestingly this is also a direct reference to the journey of emmaus and there christ appeared among his disciples but they were on a journey but they were not able to recognize him so when eliot is saying who is the third person beside you it might also mean that in this modern world even though divinity might be very much present all around us god might be present among us but we are never able to identify god it is not that we are abandoned but it is our failure to understand that there is someone with us that matters i do not know whether a man or a woman but who is that on the other side of you what is that sound high in the air is going on asking questions and it is an important aspect of this poem because i don't know about other religions but the way to salvation the way to reach any kind of conclusion in hinduism is to ask questions is to deliberate on life's realities and that is the basis of any philosophical school as well to ask questions because only through questioning only through doubting can you reach true realization and it says what is that sound high in the air murmur of maternal lamentation he is creating a situation where we are thinking about christ's death and the moments before his renewal so those are the moments when uh, mother mary was weeping for her dead son maternal lamentation who are those hooded hordes swarming over endless plains stumbling in cracked earth ringed by the flat horizon only what is the city over the mountains cracks and reforms and bursts in the violet air he creates a specific scenario where he is talking about a city over the mountains so while walking on the desert he identifies a city or tries to identify it and he gives this phrase violet air which is a reminiscent of the phrase violet hour which he has already used in the poem earlier so a moment of sunset and a moment of dryness and he's talking about a city and then he's asking which city is this which city am i seeing as if if we can identify the city he can at least understand in which century he is standing because wasteland is not just dislocated in space it is dislocated in time and he says falling towers jerusalem athens alexandria vienna london unreal so he is giving you names of the greatest cities in history and then he is saying unreal to give you the feeling that no matter what greatness these cities have aspired to have reached what accomplishments the citizens of these cities have achieved it comes to nothing everything looks unreal what is real then if human ambition if human civilization if progress is not real if the towers built by human endeavors they fall down then what is going to be our purpose of life anymore if building cities is not one of them 
A woman drew her long black hair out tight. Eliot will keep bringing women into his poems. And what is this woman doing? She is playing music and fiddled whisper music on those strings. You remember damsel with the dulcimer in a vision once I saw Kubla Khan? Women playing on musical instruments, the idea of the muse. This had been a recurrent image in British poetry. So is Eliot trying to invoke a kind of inspiring figure? If he does do this, then is he successful in this? Because what is this figure doing? She is fiddling. She is not playing confidently. She is just randomly playing strings. And it's called whisper music. So not even the kind of sonorous symphony which inspires poets. So imagination fails. The idea of an inspiring muse fails. Because when he builds up that image of a woman playing on a musical instrument, he is also hearing other things, seeing other things. And what are those things? Look at the images he's building up for us. And bats with baby faces in the violet light, note the word violet again, whistled and bet their wings. So the music of this woman is creating reaction in bats who we know they produce sounds which human beings cannot hear ultrasonic and crawled head downward down a blackened wall the repetition of the word down the use of the word black the whole scene of bats hanging with their heads down this doesn't look paradisal at all this rather looks ominous so the music of the woman is echoed through the unheard melodies of the bats but is it true that hard melodies are sweet but those unheard are sweeter we have nothing of sweetness here we only have an eerie silence and upside down in air with towers tolling reminiscent bells so right after he talks about the upside down bats he's talking about the upside down towers he had already talked about the towers of cities tumbling down. So he's kind of connecting images here. Earlier, he had desperately wanted to connect things. And he was saying, I can connect nothing with nothing. Reminiscent bells that kept the hours and voices singing out of empty cisterns and exhausted wells. Wells which do not have water, empty cisterns. You can only hear the sound of your own voice echoing across them. But you can get no sustenance, no water. In this decayed hole among the mountains, this, is he talking about that scene which he has described in front of us or is he talking about our reality also? In this decayed hole among the mountains, in the faint moonlight, the grass is sinking over the tumbled graves. It's as if... People have dug out graves to see if any resurrection is possible, if any renewal is possible out of it. About the chapel, there is the empty chapel, only the wind's home. And then he creates another scene in front of us, the scene of an empty chapel. And now we come to the story of the grail legend, the legend of Percival. Percival, the knight, he had to go on this quest for the holy grail and he had to undergo a series of tests. There, finally, he comes to this chapel perilous. Uh, he stays there overnight. Many supernatural things kept on happening. So, is Eliot trying to tell us that we are on a quest and we have encountered an empty chapel? In that grey legend, there was a moment when Percival was tested with this final test where he was in a position where he was doubting the presence of God. Is there God with me? Or is there a God at all? So, a chapel which is literally, metaphorically, spiritually abandoned is placed in front of us. We are supposed to walk in there, stay the night, experience these creepy supernatural things happening around us and uh, we have to retain our faith in God or we have to rethink if there is a God or not. It has no windows and the door swings. Dry bones can harm no one. 
Now, because it's a chapel, it possibly has a churchyard and possibly has graves in it. But the bones in the graves, they are dry. They cannot come out and harm you. So if you have faith, then nothing can harm us. That is the basic idea. That is how Percival was tested. But are we strong enough to stand this whole exercise? Are we strong enough to pass the test? Only a cock stood on the roof tree, kokori koko, in a flash of lightning, then a damp gust bringing rain. If you can withstand the night, if you can hold on through the bats turning upside down, if you can hold down through this eerie idea of dry bones all around you, if you can somehow manage to survive the night, there will be a moment when you will hear the rooster crowing, the moment of dawn. And what is more important, the moment when the rain begins to fall. Water has always, in every religion, been considered a source of salvation. But if it is considered to be the very epitome of salvation, then that is in Hinduism. And the river is the Ganga. Right after he mentions the word rain and he knows how much we were waiting as readers for the rain to start falling he mentions the word ganga as if to reinforce the idea of how important spiritually water is now when the whole world is wasted when every civilization is falling apart what is happening to ganga what is happening to the East, it is also suffering through some kind of decay, some kind of degeneration. Ganga has sunken. So it is not that apathy or despair is the fate of the West. It is also affecting the East. Ganga was sunken and the limp leaves waited for rain while the black clouds gathered far distant over Himavant. Now the word black is often used as ominous, which is also a part of uh, racist perspectives, I'm sorry to say. But when you talk about dark clouds, they become a symbol of rejuvenation because only black clouds can bring rain. These black clouds were gathering at a distance over Himavant, over the Himalayas. And Himalayas are not just a range of mountains for the Indians or for the Hindus. They are like Mount Olympus, where gods live. So the clouds gathering over the Himalayas, they are not just bringing rain. They are bringing the blessings of gods. They are bringing the message of gods. And how does a cloud give you a message? Through? Thunder. So when the gods want to speak to you, they speak through thunder. Daivavani, thunderous. And not just in Hinduism, it is the common idea even across other religions. The jungle crouched. There is expectation here. As if this whole creation is waiting for some kind of message of renewal, of hope, humped. In silence, then spoke the thunder. Da. The onomatopoeia of the word da is significant because when God speaks, he doesn't speak in any language, but through sounds that we can understand spiritually. Now let me talk to you about a fable from the Upanishads. To be more specific, from Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Brihad Aranyaka means, Brihad means great, Aranya means jungle, forest. So this fable is rooted in the idea of a great forest, the wisdom of the forest. And what is this wisdom? That there was this godhead, Prajapati, who is also conceived as Brahma. He gives advice to his children. And who are his children? Everybody is his children. Sura, Asura, Nara. Sura, the gods. 
asura the demons or you can say anti gods and nara means man so all of them they come to brahma and they seek some kind of knowledge brahma gives off the sound the same sound to each one of them and what is interesting is that men interpret it differently demons they interpret it differently and gods differently what were their interpretations when prajapati said the and then he asked have you understood then the god said we have understood that you are saying damyata brahma said yes you have understood properly i'm coming into the details of what these expressions mean then the demon said we have understood that you have said dayadvam brahma says yes you have understood properly and men say we have understood datta and what he says absolutely correct the word that was spoken was the same one it was the interpretation that changed. so now let's read this part and try to understand what eliot's stand is on this da datta so he is talking about the interpretation that men made of prajapati's words and datta means to give so it's like prajapati is saying men that you should give each other daan and what is daan daan is when you give something without the expectation of any kind of return without the expectation of any kind of glorification any kind of gratitude even so men or human beings are supposed to give each other and that is the only way humans can survive the wasteland and then the poet is asking what have we given we have only thought about ourselves my friend blood shaking my heart the awful daring of a moment surrender which an age of prudence can never retract by this and this only we have existed so human beings are capable of giving each other unconditionally and that is the only way man has been able to build something build civilization it is not built on selfishness it's built on the impulse to be more than what nature makes us we are born selfish we only think about what we need to possess but unless you give away what you possess you cannot create something new so the way to survival is basically to give and not to just receive which is not to be found in our obituaries now if you really give something in a way prajapati wants the men to then you won't want it to be recorded in your obituaries you don't want gratitude of people recorded everywhere you don't need that and this is what buddha was talking about how can you give something without expecting anything in return only when you detach yourself completely from that gift and how is that detachment possible only if we can cut off that desire to be recognized all the time you will notice that people make youtube videos even i do that and they say please like share comment so that makes it something where you hold on to your action it's as if you are gifting the video to the world and you expect them to give you something in return so true giving is not recorded in obituaries or in memories draped by the beneficent spider he is now directly taking us to the line from webster's the white devil and the line is like this they'll remarry or the worm pierce your winding sheet or the spider make a thin curtain for your epitaphs so right when you are thinking that eliot is only talking about his ideas here he suddenly bringing in a reference from the past so it's like after our death our memories are woven uh, just like a spider weaves its web and how fragile is that you touch it and it disintegrates so don't build your empires based on memories of what you have given 
what you have given without being remembered is the true gift that you have offered to this world or under the seals broken by the lean solicitor in our empty room sometimes we give after we die when we don't have anybody to inherit our property then the property automatically goes away to orphanages or the state but that is not something that we actually give so elite is saying that we need to understand that nothing remains after we die so while we are alive we should give away our possessions without thinking about what we are getting in return karma ne vadikaraste maafle shukdachana that is bhagavad gita without thinking about return you act you give now he comes to the interpretation of the demons dayatvam daya compassion i have heard the key turn in the door once and turn once only in dante's inferno there is this scene where the speaker tells about a tower and he says that he is inside the tower and somebody is locking it from outside so it's like a prison and when we have this idea of prison we understand that eliot is not talking about a physical prison here but he's talking about a spiritual one the walls we build around us the walls which not allow us to reach out to each other to see each other with compassion we are all trapped within the prison of our egos our selfishness and that key is turned it is locked so how to unlock it we think of the key each in his prison thinking of the key each conforms a prison the moment we think ourselves as single people or single person inside a prison the moment we don't conceive ourselves as a group the moment we are isolating ourselves from the rest of humanity that is conforming our loneliness because if you imagine yourself in a prison with lots of friends it won't be a prison so the moment you imagine yourself lonely you are conforming that yes it is a prison only at nightfall ethereal rumors revive for a moment a broken coriolanus now he is referring straight back to shakespeare coriolanus who was a great soldier but who acted out of pride and not duty so the idea of pride coriolanus as a symbol of egotism is used here to tell us that come out of your egos come out of your self-centered narcissism look at the world feel pity for each other because only through compassion you can connect with others you can break the walls of your prison and this was the interpretation that was made by the demons da damyata restrain daman control control what our impulses that that is something buddha would tell you the boat responded gaily to the hand expert with sail and oar the moment we come out of our selflessness the moment we begin to understand that there is a force greater than us we can surrender and in that surrender there is such peace that you are getting a guiding force so our existence our bodies our life is like a boat and right when we were thinking that we are all lost we are made to understand that no if you can be obedient if you can respond if you can somehow realize the greatness of the power which is controlling then you can sit back and enjoy your ride the sea was calm where have you heard this dover beach where anil was saying that the sea is calm but he can hear the disturbing noises of waves crashing on the shore the sea of faith that once protected the earth like a girdle is now retreating to the breath of the night winds that was dover beach for us the sea was deceptively calm then the calmness of the sea was only an apparent vision an appearance underneath there was agitation despair loneliness the sound of ignorant armies clashing by night is this sea calm in that way so 
First, we have this absence of water and then we have this image of a boat sailing across the sea. So there is water now all around us and it's calm. But is this calm a real one? It would be only if we could interpret the message of the thunder just like the gods did. And we can understand that you will be safe only if you know how to restrain yourself, dhamyata, control yourself, your impulses, your desires. Your heart would have responded gaily when invited, beating obedient to controlling hands. Become the oars, the oars of the boat. Let there be a controlling hand, beat the waters. So the heartbeat is matched with the splashing sound of the oars on the water. You might ask, why did the men, demons and gods interpret in this particular way? And why do these messages apply to these three categories? You see, the main problem with men or humans is that they are built as selfish creatures because that is what survival in nature means. Survival of the fittest. But going against this prevalent idea of Darwin, going against all the necessities of survival, you can become more than human. And that's why the message to humans was give to each other. Get rid of this idea of property because that is the root of all evil. The problem with demons or asuras is that they are ruthless. They are so ambitious that they get blinded and they act in ruthless ways. What they lack is compassion. So the demons must exercise compassion. And what about the gods? The problem with gods is that they know they are gods. And when somebody knows that they are gods, then they feel like they are superpowers. And they lack the humility because of which they become less divine. So even when you are a god, you might need a lesson in humility. The point is, in each one of us, there are these impulses. In each one of us, there is potential to turn into a demon or a god. And we are humans in any way. So these three teachings are not for separate entities, but they are for human beings who wish to understand the codes of living. I sat upon the shore. The narrative turns back again into a first-person perspective. I sat upon the shore fishing. So now we have a speaker here again, and this is our fisher king. The image that has haunted us right from the first part of the poem. So the fisher king is sitting upon the shore. The fisher king is sick. He is wounded, possibly in the groins. That is why he is infertile. And there is a curse in his kingdom because the infertility of the king is somehow related to the lack of prosperity of his land. The knight Percival, he offers a cure. Find the Holy Grail and the king will be restored. So the king is waiting, sitting for his regeneration in a moment suspended between death and rebirth and is thinking. With the arid plain behind me, shall I at least set my lands in order? So the fisher king is not sure if he can achieve any miraculous cure or not. So we are looking at Fisher King sitting, fishing, thinking about his lands and then we are expecting him to give a detail about what properties he has and then we have a peculiar list coming right after this which starts with London Bridge is falling down, falling down, falling down. That's a nursery rhyme, isn't it? How can a nursery rhyme be a property of a Fisher King? Let's read on. Poesi Escos Nel Foco Chegli Afina Quando Fiam Muti Shelidan. This is a line from Purgatorio by Dante and it translates to 
he hid himself in the fire which refines them purgatorio is about purgatory it is the place where you spend time get purified in a way and then get permission to enter paradiso so it's a cleansing space it's a place where your sins your guilt everything is burnt away to oh, swallow swallow wait a minute this is the myth of philomela we have already read about it what what is the swallow the swallow is a bird which becomes here a symbol of transformation metamorphosis so what the poet is trying to transform into a bird transform into something to escape this waste land this this disorder this chaos la prince de aquitaine a la tour aboli the prince of aquitaine in the ruined tower it comes from a french sonnet these fragments i have showed against my ruins so these are the things that i have collected down the line london bridge is falling down lines from purgatorio the mythologies by ovid and a french sonnet so definitely the fisher king is not talking specifically about some poems or literary pieces the poet is rather talking about the whole body of literature so these are just random examples to point at the whole genre of creative writing so who is the fisher king he lit himself he feels that he is infertile he feels that a quest needs to be successfully done performed to bring him rejuvenation and he is at this moment sitting pondering about his properties and as a poet as a reader the only asset he has is the whole body of literature he has studied and he can only remember fragments and he cannot connect one with another and he says these fragments i have showed against my ruins these fragments external literary pieces my ruins something personal so we find that the poetic persona is trying to connect and collect all these fragments and make a whole trying to make sense of how he can create something out of it why then i'll fit you in in spanish tragedy the subtitle is hieronymus mad again and he uses exactly that expression why then i'll fit you hieronymus mad again why is he saying this iliad maintained that hamlet the play by shakespeare is built upon thomas kidd's spanish tragedy and the subtitle is hieronymus mad again that the central figure hieronymo he is asked to write a play and he says i'll fit you i i'll write a play for you which also means i'll give you what you have coming in hamlet we see that hamlet writes a play which ends up revealing the fact that his uncle was the murderer of his father so in both these cases in hamlet and in the spanish tragedy writing of a play is actually seen as something not very harmless but that actually creates an impact so iliad is trying to not just write a poem he's trying to create something where it will be as significant as the work created by hamlet in the play hamlet or hieronymo in the play the spanish tragedy so he says why then i'll fit you and when you have this expression hieronymo is mad again you associate creativity literary creativity with madness and immediately then because this fifth part gives us a faint hint at the idea of the damsel with the dulcimer it is not unnatural for us to remember the mad man described by coleridge towards the end of the same poem kubla khan where he says that a person inspired by imagination is like a mad person and everybody is scared of him because he on honey dew hath fed and drunk the milk of paradise madness creativity comes hand in hand and eliot recovering in that special facility 
suffering through psychological despair, was hoping that his writing could bring rain to the intellectual deprivation. And he was hoping that this poem would be like an incantation, like a mantra. And he says, Datta dayatvam damyata Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. He wants us to feel that we have reached the end of a meditative mantra. This is like reaching the end point of dhyana. You have questioned yourself, reached the nadir of doubt, because only from there can you bring out these words that actually mean peace that passes understanding. But he does not use only one single expression shanti and stop there. He uses it three times because he is not using the word shanti only to mean peace. He is using the repetition of the word, the ritualistic chanting of the word as if he is blessing us. And what is the ritual associated with uh, you know, saying the words Shanti, Shanti, Shanti? The high priest, after performing the puja, after performing any kind of divine ritual, he sprinkles holy water on the devotee as if he is passing on the blessing, passing on the wisdom that he has received in the rituals through that water and he says shanti 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 what is Iliad sprinkling on us he is sprinkling the fragments that he has collected all down to his age he is sprinkling at us Dante's purgatorio he is sprinkling at us the great legends the Spanish tragedy the myth of Philomela so he is trying to say that the only way to move on from this, to break the intellectual wastedness, is to reinvent the past, to recognize the past and through the blessings of those past memories of literature can we move ahead. You will understand his idea perfectly well if you read the essay tradition and individual talent where he says no poet no author writes alone and so that idea matches with the idea that there is always a third walking beside you the idea of a presence the influence and the anxiety of influence so he finishes his poem with a blessing showering on us or rather I would say sprinkling on us, and the message that the only hope of survival is through interpreting the words of the thunder, through understanding the codes of nature, and through datta tayatvam tamyata, because only then we can reach the supreme state of shanti, and eventually the supreme state of nirvana. So the wasteland is not about a wasted place. It's about what to do when you are a prisoner of your own desires and you feel like everything around you is rocky and wasted. So it is not a poem of despair, but it's a poem of a possibility of hope when everything looks tumbled down. I really hope you didn't have this poem in your syllabus you didn't have to prepare exam papers for it because this is a poem too profound. This is a poem which is better if just read, understood, felt. But it's a pity, isn't it? But I hope this video has been useful. Just one request. Don't forget this poem after your exams are over because when you are feeling all lost and in despair, maybe these fragments would help you recover. So that's it. We have reached the end of the wasteland. I hope to catch you soon with another video. Till then, stay subscribed.
to get notified every time a new video comes up this is mona mukherjee signing off